anyone who knows me knows that I'm like the least controversial person. I mean, my whole brand is finding gracious, non-controversial ways to handle otherwise controversial subjects. That's what I've been doing for 25 years, helping people talk to each other and find a way forward in the midst of major disagreements. So how did I end up in the middle of controversy the last few weeks? Justin Lee. Justin Lee. Justin Lee. Am I controversial all of a sudden? Should I find a different career? Hmm. Okay, before we go any further, I know the question some of you have is, Hey, Justin, where have you been? And the answer to that is long, so I'll talk about it in another video. But yes, I'm back to making new videos, and I really appreciate all the kind words. Thank you. But today I have a story. It's a story about heroes and villains. A story about truth and empathy. It's the story of conservative evangelical parents and their LGBTQ kids. And the story starts with this guy. His name is Andy Stanley, and he's the pastor of one of the largest churches in America, North Point Community Church in Atlanta. Andy is a very influential evangelical preacher, as was his dad, Charles Stanley. I remember watching Charles Stanley's sermons on TV when I was a kid. Now, I know there's a stereotype about evangelical megachurch pastors, especially ones that come from famous families. Praise be to he. But Andy Stanley is no righteous gemstone. His reputation is that of a genuine, kind, and compassionate leader. One who talks about church as a place where everyone should be welcomed and given a chance to meet Jesus. In a world of polarization and battle lines, that feels to a lot of people like a breath of fresh air. And it's attracted him a huge following. But not everyone is an Andy Stanley fan. And for one thing, he's a fairly traditional evangelical who teaches, like most evangelicals, that biblical marriage is between a man and a woman. And there are plenty of folks who disagree with him on that, even among evangelicals. It's a controversial issue that's splitting churches and denominations right now. But surprisingly, some of the harshest criticism he's faced comes from the other side, from other traditional evangelicals. Their criticism centers on the fact that Andy Stanley doesn't often preach on homosexuality or LGBTQ issues, and that when he does mention LGBTQ people in his sermons, it's often with a great deal of empathy. A gay person who still wants to attend church after the way the church has treated the gay community? I'm telling you, they have more faith than I do. They have more faith than a lot of you. A gay person who knows, you know what? I might not be accepted here, but I'm gonna try it anyway. Have you ever done that as a straight person? That's attracted attention because honestly, it's kind of unusual. And we're used to hearing evangelical pastors bring up LGBTQ people, or gay people specifically, only when talking about sin. Either to reinforce that homosexuality is a sin, or to depart from tradition and argue that homosexuality isn't a sin. For a prominent pastor to just express empathy for gay people without making a statement about sin at the same time, raise some eyebrows. Some people criticized him for going soft on sin, while others argued that he was doing exactly what pastors in his position ought to do more of being compassionate and treating LGBTQ people as people instead of just as issues. But whether you agree or disagree with his approach, there's a point he raised in his sermon last week that I don't think I've ever heard a pastor raise before. When our children come out of the closet and we discover our child is LGBTQ+, most Christian parents, most Christian parents go into the closet where many experience isolation and depression. He's quoting here from Lynn McDonald, a Christian mom who, together with her husband, wrote a book called Embracing the Journey. The McDonalds experienced this parent's closet firsthand when they discovered that one of their children was gay, which created some conflicts with their conservative evangelical faith. Now, I've met many parents in this situation, and Lynn is right. They do often feel confused and isolated, unsure how to love their child and stay true to their faith. And because this is such a hot-button issue in many churches, there's often just no support for them. No one they feel comfortable talking to who shares their faith and knows what it's like to go through this. Yeah, I've often talked on this channel about how difficult this is for the LGBTQ kid in this situation, and it is. But it's also difficult and lonely for their Christian parents, who are starting their own journey long after the child started theirs, and who are struggling to catch up. You know, even if they do get up the courage to talk to people about what they're going through, they often get these simplistic, unhelpful answers from folks. You know, just stop believing what you believe, or just put your foot down and send your kid Bible verses, and then it's on them. 
But the truth is, these parents need empathy and support, not just simplistic answers from people who've never been in their shoes. So, the McDonald's experience in this area led them not only to write a book on the subject, but ultimately to start a ministry for Christian parents of LGBTQ kids, also called Embracing the Journey. There's a link to it in the description of the video. Meanwhile, Reverend Stanley's church, North Point, had also recognized that this was a problem and has for years had their own similar ministry for parents called Parent Connect. So, the bad news is, this is a huge problem for a lot of parents in a lot of churches. But the good news is that these parent-led ministries were trying to address it. And that's what brings us to a couple weeks ago, when North Point Church agreed to let Embracing the Journey use their space to put on a conference for Christian parents of LGBTQ kids. A conference for parents, by parents. Just to finally give them a safe space to talk about what they're going through, hear each other's stories, worship and pray together, and get tools for staying connected to their kids, even if they don't agree with all their kids' decisions. Hundreds of parents attended from across the country. The conference sold out completely. And in these private sessions, parents wept as they shared how painful and lonely it had felt to go through this in churches without that kind of parent support. They talked about mistakes they'd made with their kids, words they wished they could take back, and struggles they'd had in their own faith on this journey. But there was also a sense of celebration and joy and hope for the future as they connected with other Christians who'd been there and who could offer them encouragement. And to minister to these parents, the conference organizers invited mental health professionals, pastors, and others who'd been down this road before. Not to lecture them about what their kids should do differently, but to offer them, the parents, practical tools on their own journey. And I know this because I was one of the people they invited. See, I have a lot of experience in this area. I've been through it personally in my own family, and over the years I've worked with many other families in this situation. Just a few days ago, I had the incredible privilege of accompanying an LGBTQ friend of mine as they reunited for the first time with the evangelical parents they hadn't seen for over seven years. I'm not going to go into detail on that because it's not my story to tell, but yeah, I can tell you that there were a lot of tears. These family situations are so delicate and so nuanced, and every single one is different. And at this point, I have walked this journey with more people on both sides of this than probably just about anyone in the world. It's one reason I've been repeatedly invited to speak to evangelical audiences on this subject, and why they keep inviting me back. Because I know this subject well, and I have 25 years of experience speaking to audiences from whatever common ground we have, rather than focusing on our differences. I mean, you know, unless they specifically ask me to do otherwise. Plus, I have two relevant books on the subject. My book, Torn, is about what it feels like to wrestle with your sexuality in an evangelical church, and it's become a popular book for Christian parents who want to understand what their kids are going through. And my book, Talking Across the Divide, is about strategies for maintaining a positive relationship with someone, even when you disagree on something important, like theology or politics. So the organizers of this conference called me up and said, a number of our parents have read your stuff and found it really helpful, and we're wondering if you'd be willing to come speak to them, to offer some tools to help these struggling parents stay connected to their kids and their faith. And I said, of course I will. Just tell me what you need and I will be there. But then, in the days leading up to the conference, something happened. The news broke that Andy Stanley's church was hosting something LGBTQ related, and all the nuance, all the complexity, just got brushed aside in favor of talking points. People who were already suspicious of Andy Stanley began spinning the conference as evidence for their criticisms of him personally. And the thing is, Andy Stanley wasn't even that involved in putting this, on, uh, putting this conference on. I mean, at least as far as I'm aware. He's not the one who organized it. He's not the one who set the agenda. He's not the one who invited the speakers. But because his church offered the space for the conference, and because he agreed to attend and do a Q&A session as a pastor, some of his pre-existing critics began looking closely at the conference to see whether they could find anything objectionable about it. And what they found was that two of the invited speakers were gay. One of those was me. And that suddenly became the headline. Andy Stanley, that guy we already suspected was going soft on sin, is hosting a conference on LGBTQ issues with openly gay speakers. 
And because I was one of those speakers, it didn't take long before my name was being specifically thrown around by bloggers and Christian news outlets. People who'd never heard of me before were digging into my personal life to try to find something to discredit me with. And famous and influential church leaders like Al Mohler, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, were talking about me as if I were some enemy activist coming to the conference to convert everyone to my way of thinking on same-sex marriage or something. And look, I, you know, I'm not scared of criticism or disagreement or difficult conversations, but it was clear that the majority of folks writing about me didn't actually know anything about me, except that I was gay. Because for most of them, honestly, this wasn't about me at all. It was about their views on Reverend Stanley and their concerns about the future of the church. Dropping my name was just a way for them to make a point about him. Now, a lot of the furor, at least from what I've seen, died down after the conference, especially once Reverend Stanley preached a sermon clarifying his views on marriage. And again, there's a link to that in the description. But I've been thinking about this a lot over the last few days, because to me, it's such a clear example of what's gone wrong in both our culture and in the church about how we respond to complicated situations and people we disagree with. Because I think so many of us have gotten trapped in what I call children's movie mindset. In the children's movies and TV shows that most of us grew up with, there are heroes and there are villains. And the heroes are honorable and good and stand for truth and make all the right decisions. And the villains are evil and selfish and cruel and stand for everything bad. The heroes always do the right thing and the villains always do the wrong thing. And yeah, there is good and evil in the world, but conflicts between human beings are often complicated. And yet it's so easy for any of us to slip into that children's movie mindset, treating every conflict as if one side is the always right heroes and the other side is the always wrong villains. But in real life, we're all a mix. We're all sinners. We're all sometimes selfish. We all make mistakes. We all get things wrong. This is an essential piece of Christian doctrine, but it requires a more nuanced approach to conflict than the one we see in children's entertainment. I mean, He-Man doesn't try to minister to Skeletor, or forgive Skeletor, or pray for Skeletor's redemption. Cartoon villains generally don't get redeemed at all, they just get defeated, humiliated, incapacitated, killed. Either that or they're just around forever to keep doing battle with the hero, always plotting their evil plans for the next encounter. I will get you next time. Next time. We aren't supposed to look for the good in them. We're just supposed to hate them. But what does it mean if we take that approach to human beings? You know, when we find out one thing about somebody that we disagree with them on, I don't agree with this pastor's approach. I don't agree with this speaker's personal life. I don't agree with this blogger's theology. And then suddenly that's enough for us to decide that that person is a capital V villain. They're not just wrong about one thing, they're wrong about everything. They have no redeeming qualities. They have nothing worthwhile to teach us. And once we've decided that, why bother trying to see their side of things or look for nuance in the situation? I see this children's movie mindset all the time in the way that our world responds to public figures and current events. Like when someone does something courageous or meaningful and suddenly we all idolize them as if they're the perfect hero we should all aspire to be. Until later on, when we learn something unflattering about them, an offensive joke they made, or a concerning opinion they hold, or ways that they haven't lived up to the values they've expressed, and then suddenly they go from perfectly good hero to perfectly evil villain. And more and more, I see people do this not just with public figures, but with people they know well. Someone says something on social media and it totally changes our opinion of them. Why is it so hard for us to say, this person is, like all of us, a mixed bag, a work in progress? I'm not saying excuse bad behavior or put all kinds of sin in the same bucket. But we can condemn the bad joke or wrong belief or harmful action and still see what's good in the person, what God sees in them. I can disagree with Andy Stanley on some of his beliefs and still have a ton of respect for him. Those things aren't mutually exclusive. And I can say that I wish the people who wrote negative things about me had taken the trouble to contact me first 
like Jesus' approach to conflict in Matthew 18, and at the same time, also say that I understand where they're coming from, why they're worried about the future of the church and the possible influence of false teaching. I don't think that's unreasonable. I just wish they'd had more nuance. Because it is possible for them also to disagree with me on some of my personal beliefs and still at the same time see why it might be helpful for someone with my experience to be at this conference and talk to those hurting parents. Because, yeah, it's true. I do believe in same-sex marriage. And I know that puts me out of step with most conservative evangelicals, including Andy Stanley and North Point Church. But that wasn't what I was speaking on. And it wasn't what the conference was about. And if anyone had asked me, I would have been happy to tell them exactly what I was going to talk about. But out of all the people writing about me, only one person ever asked. And maybe people didn't care what I was going to say. Maybe they just assumed that my being gay and affirming should have disqualified me from speaking to this church audience on any subject. But if disagreement on one point is the litmus test that turns someone from good guy to bad guy with nothing worthwhile to offer, someone whose very presence, therefore, should be a major controversy, then what hope is there for churches that discover disagreements within their congregation, or parents who find disagreement within their families? I'm not downplaying the importance of this particular disagreement. It's an important subject, it's important to get it right, and we don't agree on what the right answer is. There's no getting around that. But there's a big difference between the approach of Jesus, who called out sin, but also welcomed anyone who was trying to get things right, even when they were getting it wrong, and the approach of our divided culture, caught up in that children's movie mindset, treating any disagreement as proof that you're an irredeemable villain. Jesus saw the good even in his opponents, and he taught his followers to love even their enemies. And the love that he demonstrated wasn't just a condescending love. It was a love that saw the good and the worthwhile, even in those who had gotten a lot of stuff wrong. He made a Samaritan the hero of the story, even though he didn't agree with all the beliefs of the Samaritans. He praised the centurion's faith, even though he surely would have had plenty to criticize there as well. His closest friends were among the biggest sinners of the day. Because, at least according to the Bible, we're all in the same boat. It's not about drawing a line between the good guys and the bad guys. It's about realizing that even our heroes can get things wrong sometimes. And even the people we most disagree with can sometimes get things right. It's like they say, you know, even a broken clock is right sometimes. Well, I mean, unless it's a digital clock. Anyway, the Bible is filled with examples of people who sometimes got it right and other times got it really, really wrong. Just look at David. Is he a hero? Is he a villain? What are you? What am I? You disagree with something that I say or do, that's fine. Don't hold back. Let's talk it out. And if I've gotten something wrong, I want to know and make it right. But let's have that conversation as friends, people who still see the good in each other, not throwing rocks at each other from across a divide. I won't pretend to be perfect. All I know is that if God has shown me grace for all my mistakes, I am in no position to deny grace to anyone else. Are you? <laughs>